Uh, Mr. David Shootbridge. Madam Deputy President, I rise on behalf of the Greens to express our opposition to the Rural Fires Amendment Vegetation Clearing Bill 2014. And there are three principal reasons why the Greens oppose this bill. The first is it will give landowners and occupiers a false sense of security, um, uh, and a sense of security, a false sense of security that may ultimately put them at risk of bushfires. The second is it will reduce essential interaction between the Rural Fire Service, the experts, um, and uh, the people who can give the, the best advice to landowners. It will reduce that interaction between landowners and occupiers and the RFS. And thirdly, that it will create unacceptable damage to a large amount of environmentally sensitive oh, bushland across the state. One, this bill creates new ten, what are called 1050 vegetation clearing entitlement areas. We're subject to um, what, we're, what is yet to be publicly provided, the, the, sorry, we're subject to the yet to be publicly provided 1050 Vegetation Clearing Code of Practice. Homeowners and occupiers and landowners can clear trees within 10, 10 metres and any vegetation apart from trees within 50 metres of their home without having to apply for permissions that would otherwise be required. The Commissioner is tasked under this bill through the, new, the proposed new Section 100Q with preparing a 1050 Vegetation Clearing Code of Practice. That covers the type of vegetation that can be cleared, when it should be pruned rather than removed, the use of herbicides, erosion, landslip risks, riparian buffer zones and the like. The code of practice, we're told, will operate in 1050 vegetation clearing, clearing entitlement areas, and those areas will be determined by the Commissioner on a map or maps published on the New South Wales Rural Fire Service website. Um, of course, this, this House is making this legislation without having seen the Code of Practice. We don't know what controls and what protections will be put in place. This House is, making these, uh, is proposing to make these laws without having seen any indicative maps we of where it will apply. And, 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 the, oh. a, and indeed, the when you look at the, at the mapping of bushfire... Order. Members will come to order. Thank Mr. David Chibridge. When, when you look at the maps of bushfire-prone land where this could be applied across the state, um, it, it covers large swathes of extremely, um, extremely sensitive and valued um, uh, bushland around the, the foreshores of Sydney, um, throughout the Blue Mountains, um, uh, adjoining the Blue Mountains National Park, in large swathes of highly valued coastal bushland up and down the coast, um, as well as in uh, extremely important and valued scenic areas across the state, um, such as the Dorigo Plateau, around the state. Large well, and I note the interjection from the, um, the Honourable Robert Borzak that they won't be very scenic once this law passes. And uh, indeed, when they're all, um, when they're all and, and indeed, that is, that is true. That is true. That is true. That's a, that's so a, under the proposed um, Section 100R, vegetation can be cleared in a, 10, in a 1050 vegetation clearing entitlement area if it is a tree within 10 metres or vegetation within 50 metres of an external wall of a building containing habitable rooms or what's called a high-risk facility, which is a school, childcare centre or hospital. And indeed, that definition of high-risk facility is used in a variety of other parts of, of, um, of, of the law regarding bushfire risk. The bill clarifies that it applies only where there is a development consent or other lawful authority for the building. Though habitable is the definition, there is not a requirement that the rooms are in fact habit inhabited. Section 100S creates a requirement for the Minister to review this division and its policy objectives as soon as possible, uh, two years after the commencement of the division. The Minister is required to report to the Premier on the outcome of the review, but there is, unfortunately, no requirement for the outcome to be tabled in Parliament or be made public. Schedule 2 creates exceptions to the National Parks and Wildlife Act for offences that harm or damage threatened species um, for vegetation clearing in a vegetation clearing entitlement area. The bill also makes a number of other amendments to the Rural Fires Act 1997 that bring employment matters up to date and revise provisions relating to bushfire hazard reduction certificates. This bill is a substantial attack on biodiversity in New South Wales and goes too far in allowing property holders discretion to remove trees and vegetation even where these are not contributing to bushfire risk. The idea that an as yet unsighted code of practice would be sufficient to ensure vegetation clearing is done in a way that protects riparian zones, Aboriginal and other cultural heritage, um, uh, is, is, is quite extraordinary. 
It is also concerning that the government is asking this House to pass this legislation without ever citing uh, the code of practice or a draft code of practice that will actually give some indication to the government or those cheerleaders on the government be benches yeah, about, them, about how it will them. be implemented. The Minister's second reading <coughs> speech identified that there were 30 million hectares of bushfire prone land in this state. 30 million hectares. That is a worrying indication of the amount of land on which he, his government and his uh, supporters in, in, this, in, this, in this chamber think, uh, think will be, would be appropriate for clearing. And indeed, the, um, the, the statement from the Honourable Rick Collis in his second reading contribution um, to this chamber made it clear that he wants to go further. He wants to increase the amount of vegetation that can be cleared. He wants to have additional trees uh, subject of clearing. Um, and, and I note, I note that the, um, the, the, shooters, the Shooters MPs uh, are proposing to put amendments forward to uh, increase the amount of land, and indeed I hear them talking about um, clearing of national parks uh, in, in their interjections. And, and I note the hear here, the hear here from, um, from the Honourable Rick Collis from the government uh, in support of that concept of clearing national parks. Uh, if, if people are concerned about our environment, people concerned about a rational approach to fire management, um, could hear the kind of enthusiasm in this chamber for going vastly beyond this, this legislation, for the wholesale clearing of up to 30 million hectares or more, if some of the advocates for clearing in this, in this, 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 um, uh, this state propose, uh, they would and should be deeply disturbed. This bill has been criticised by a number of stakeholders on the grounds that it will reduce contact between residents in bushfire prone their areas and the RFS by allowing residents to clear without contact or assistance from the RFS, who are the acknowledged bushfire experts. Indeed, bushfire survival plans, um, which, are, which, which can be uh, essential, absolutely essential tools for homeowners, uh, for occupiers in these vulnerable parts of our state uh, are best done in consultation with the RFS. Best done in consultation with the RFS. Uh, sitting down, discussing them and working out a series of strategies uh, to protect your property in consultation with the experts. But if this legislation passes, as undoubtedly it will, there will be many landowners who, instead of contacting the RFS and finding out about the suite of measures that will best protect their property, checking on their eaves, having certain water supply in place, um, uh, treatment to their house and surrounds outside of, of the arrangements proposed in this, in this legislation, they will not be contacting the RFS because they will have a false sense of security that if they clear in accordance with um, this 1050 rule, they will have a false sense of security that they've protected their homes and they've done the best they can. They won't have. The best they can do is to sit down and speak with the RFS, ensure that they, they come on the property and they talk together about the bushfire survival plan that, can be, that, can be, uh, that may well be essential for the protection of their home, their property and their loved ones um, if, if, and in many cases when, a bushfire approaches the edge of their property. Also in the second reading speech, uh, it's claimed that the bill strikes a balance between environmental protection and household property safety. Given the fact the bill is all about allowing clearing of property and there are no identified safeguards in this legislation, it's very difficult indeed to see how that could indeed be the case. The detailed briefing provided by the Parliamentary Library on this issue is very informative and I'd, I'd suggest members um, take the time to, to read it at length. But it clearly shows that the greatest risk to property is in fact living within 100 metres of a forest, not the proximity of a small number of trees closer to a house. And that is because, in many cases, it's that ember attack that goes ahead of the fire front, up to 100 metres ahead of the fire front, um, which is responsible for spot fires in residential areas and for the loss of many residential homes. But well outside the, the region that's going to be proposed to be protected under this bill. And again, how is the best way of protecting residents from those spot fires that start from those ember attacks that go 100 metres or more in front of a fire? To sit down with the RFS and do your bushfire uh, survival plan, uh, sit down and work out a suite of measures to protect your property from bushfires, not simply just get the chainsaws out and clear trees uh, within 10 metres of your house. Um, um, and one of the best ways we can preserve lives and property from bushfires is to properly resource the Rural Fire Service and ensure that development does not occur in the most bushfire-prone parts of New South Wales. And disturbingly again, 
we saw the government, with its original proposed planning bill, was proposing to get rid of the requirement for local government authorities um, to consult with the Rural Fire Service um, before they allowed development in bushfire-prone land. Uh, so on one hand, this government says it's deeply concerned about development in bushfire-prone land, but we know they were at advanced stage of planning under their planning bills to actually remove the requirement for local government to consult with the Rural Fire Service before they opened up bushfire-prone land to residential development. Um, the, this government is not being honest with the people of New South Wales about, about a number of things, about a good many things. But in particular, they're not being honest with the people of New South Wales about how to seriously address the concern of development, both future and existing development, on bushfire-prone land. If they were serious about it, they would be putting in substantial restrictions, uh, um, uh, preventing further, further residential development in any bushfire-prone land. But we don't see that. Indeed, in large part, this government wants to remove the restrictions for development in bush, bushfire prone land, create more risk for, land, uh, for, for homeowners around this state. Um, and, and they're doing that on one hand, creating more risk, putting more future residents at risk of, 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 of bushfire fronts from development, uh, 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 in, engulfing development in bushfire prone land by encouraging that kind of development on the one hand. And then, on the other hand, crying crocodile tears and putting this kind of ineffective legislation up uh, on the other. Um, it, this government is not genuinely, it has not seeking to genuinely grapple with the risks that we're going to see, increasing risks with climate change, of that, uh, res that, that interaction between residential development and bushfire prone land across the state. These risks are going to get worse as, as, as we have a hotter and drier future. And we do need to be adaptive in, how, in our laws um, and in our fire management dams. practices. We absolutely do need to be adaptive. We need more dams. So it's not a question of, of, of the Greens opposing any change to, <laughs> to, to these kind of laws. Indeed, we think we do need to be um, very proactive in looking at how we manage the risk of development in bushfire prone land, uh, because there are millions of hectares across the state where we should be saying no to development full stop, not allowing inappropriate development, putting people at risk, and then coming up with these kind of ineffective ad hoc methods to reduce the risk, such as we're seeing here. Um, this requires a much more comprehensive approach to land management in New South Wales than this kind of band-aid solution here. There is a real risk that this will, in fact, um, see less contact with the RFS, put more property owners at risk, um, that, than, than the existing <laughs> arrangements, where people are encouraged to sit down and consult with the RFS and put that suite of measures in to protect their, to protect their properties. Um, it's for those reasons that the Greens do not support this legislation, and indeed it's for those reasons that um, we would urge other members to actually reject this bill and insist on this government being serious about addressing the risk of development uh, and, and risks to life and property um, in that crucial interaction between our, some of our most beautiful and environmentally sensitive parts of this state and areas where there is a constant and growing pressure for development.